hello everyone. We're so excited to have a very special panel. My name is Dr. Erkita DeRowan and I'm been working in healthcare tech for a few years and I'm one of the board members of GDI. So you guys hold a very special place in my heart and I'm super excited that we have a hackathon like dedicated to healthcare. So you guys are gonna have some really great projects and go and save the world and all of those things. So we have very special panelists on our panel today. So I'm just gonna give each person an opportunity to just give us like a two second blurb of your name and your current job title and role. And we'll move forward and talk more deeply about your career journey as the panel goes on. So let's start with Sarah. Hi there, I'm Sarah Luciano. Um, I'm currently showing up as Katie Bryden, but that's just for camera reasons. Um, I am a, an associate principal clinical data scientist with a Premier Research Group, and I've been in the healthcare field in tech for about 17 years. Awesome. And Elizabeth? Hi, I'm Elizabeth Sakara. I am currently, I manage a population health team out of the San Francisco Health Plan, but I also am considered a trans health expert and work with national agencies on improving data collection for, uh, for queers. Awesome. <laughs> Nachari? Hi everyone, I'm Nachari Riley. I'm a principal designer at a creative agency based in Los Angeles, where I work on designing um, human-centered experiences, um, particularly in healthcare. Um, before that, um, and my uh, latest year, I was a maternal health researcher and spatial epidemiologist um, working in uh, the international field. Awesome. And Dr. Aaron? Yep. You're on mute. So sorry, y'all. I'm Dr. Erin Jones coming to you from Los Angeles, California. I'm a clinical professor of family medicine at the University of Southern California. I also work in the tech space as a staff physician at one of the biggest telemedicine healthcare groups in the country. Awesome. So as we can see, there is quite a diversity of expertise and we have different subject matters experts here, but we all are kind of involved in technology and healthcare, which is a very exciting and growing field. So I'm just going to kind of, this may be hard because people love chatting about themselves, but I'm just going to ask each of you just kind of in the order of where you are in my screen to kind of tell us about your career journey, how it applies to healthcare, and kind of what drove you to shift into health technology. So I will start once again with Sarah. Hey there. So my journey started actually um, as a data entry clerk. Uh, I was temping. I was in my early 20s. It was in different time when data entry was on paper and um, quickly took to that kind of work. Uh, and it was doing data entry for clinical research organizations, which are sometimes called um, contract research organizations. They're groups that typically work with pharmaceutical companies to monitor and evaluate clinical trials um, in an outside way to prepare those for FDA approval. So I sort of had a knack for the work and have been doing it now for about 17 years, so I didn't come in with a healthcare background, but working in different phases of clinical trials, I was able to learn as I went and being able to adapt to different types of database development gave me a lot of insight into the ways that we could improve um, the processes moving forward. So I try to take a really heavy process approach to what I do because I like repeatability because it's effective and it's cost savings and it just makes good sense. So um, that's sort of the approach I take to most things. I did sort of end up in this field, not through medicine or technology, but just sort of by accident and happened to find what I love. So that's how I got here. I love that story. And I think you bring up a great point because we have a lot of different people hopefully watching this live and they may watch it on the replay and they're thinking like, 
I don't care about health or whatever. I just want to be a program manager. Or I just want to be in UX and stuff. But there's so many different applications and transferable skills that you guys have that you can use and apply to a lot of different careers. And you can even work to help people. And like you said, you found a job and a career that you love that you weren't even expecting to go into. I mean, I didn't know it was a job. Yeah. I was like, oh, someone looks at that? Good. Oh, I could do that for a job and they'll pay me? Even better. <laughs> Absolutely. And I will go with Nature now. Well, I think the summary of it was, I remember I was actually leaving one company to do the whole user experience pivot. And um, my director at the time said, I have no idea what you're trying to do. Good luck. <laughs> And so I feel like a lot of what I've been trying to do is answer that question for other people, showing the significance of both healthcare and it's something that we is on a lot of our minds, especially lately, um, as well as how to actually design experiences with people at the center and not necessarily just focusing on the many things that make people and especially funders comfortable like numbers behind those numbers are humans, real humans, and you're really trying to impact their lives in a positive way. Um, and so I decided to take uh, my um, subject matter expertise in public health and specifically public health research, and then really refine what that means and really shaping and building experiences that I felt were important to include other people in. Um, and so through those experiences, that's when I started um, focusing more on user experience research um, and how to design those experiences, like working um, through for federal COVID-19 response initiatives and um, many different initiatives from service design components for mental health all the way through, you know, designing experiences for caregivers. So um, that's the summary of, <laughs> of where things are, but it's really the totality of my experience is asking myself questions um, about how I can most impact society positively and then using my experiences at different entities, organizations, hackathons to answer those questions that I have. I love that. And of course, we're going to, we have until about 1.15 for those who are listening. So we're going to ask questions and talk amongst ourselves and think about new things. But I love what you said, because the title of this panel is called Innovations and Opportunity Health Tech. So when you were mentioning that with as things evolved in life, like nobody ever knew that we were going to enter a global pandemic in a couple of years ago. So you were able to define, like redefine what public health meant and how you could change the meaning and apply it in different ways that hadn't been done before. So with technology, we can use these things and these methods that we have been learning for years, or you may be learning now and something new may pop up and you may be able to figure out how to relate it to something else and create something entirely new. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that summary too. <laughs> awesome. um, Dr. Aaron Jones. This is such an exciting panel. Um, for me, I was always interested in health and medicine. And so I always had my sights on being a physician from the time I started college. I always wanted to work with the community. It's where my heart's always been. So I did family medicine and community health and I see everybody. I see little kids, I see adults, I see older adults, I see all kinds of people. And it lets me know kind of like what's the pulse of what's going on. It let me work with trans youth at the beginning when we started doing more medical care. It lets me know what's going on with the pandemic. We learn more about how like infections surge and we learn about people's actual struggles. And sometimes it's healthcare adjacent and it shows up in our office, but it is not healthcare essential, you know? It's more of a system problem. And that's really what led me into working in the tech space is that for the better or worse, people really need to have doctor now. You know, we used to have long-term relationships with people, but the way the gig economy works and the way societies change, people really need to have healthcare at their fingertips. And so health tech gives us an opportunity to do so. But learning how to marry it into 
traditional healthcare is a whole big space for opportunity and we're, that's what we're here for today. I love that too, because spoiler alert, I also work in health tech as a physician and, and Dr. Jones and I actually uh, train together. But it's so true, like there are so many things in the healthcare realm in which you learn how to deal with problems and hopefully help people live through their experiences that are coming at them as they age or as they come up with a new disease or they're dealing with loss and all of these things that are happening over a lifespan. But with technology, there's this open window of the society that we live in now where it's kind of like a, we want it right now. So we have to figure out how to merge that human aspect of medicine with this growing field of technology and marry it together. And with that, there are so many opportunities because there are so many health tech companies coming up, whether or not it's in the telehealth space or the mental health space or wearable devices or working at these CROs and all of these different opportunities. But with that, there are so many different subject matter experts, as we see here in this panel, where we have to learn how to take each other's advice and work collaboratively as a team. So we may need to reach out to someone in public health and say, okay, how can we utilize this data to see how, what Dr. Jones is seeing in the clinic with people with COVID-19 or high blood pressure or something like that to marry it and be able to reproduce it on a grander scale to help larger populations and more people. So the world is basically your oyster for those listeners out there who are watching this because there are so many things out there where we can utilize what's already been done and create entirely new processes. So I'm very excited to see what you guys come up with with this hackathon. And lastly, we'll hear the journey of Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, that was perfect because my job is that it's taking clinical care and all of the data that comes along with that clinical care, whether it be in primary care, uh, specialty care or hospitals, uh, and merging that data to that clinical story. But as a population health team, we have to also take in more than that because we know that data is very flawed um, within medicine and it's biased. And so how we account for that from a population health model, I'll get into that a little bit more later. But personally for my journey, I did, um, did not start in healthcare. I was a, a child who did salsa packing and um, worked in the United States Postal Service uh, overnight shift for many years. And then I had done AmeriCorps my money back. So I was like, I gotta, I have to do something. So I became a nurse and I got my associate's degree in nursing. So I'm also a big advocate for alternative education pathways um, as well, because it definitely changed the course of my life. Um, so at starting as a non-traditional student and going into nursing was like a big opportunity for me. And I started out doing med surge and uh, neuro step down. And I was working at Stanford Hospital. Um, I started out on the East Coast, moved to the West Coast, as a travel nurse at Stanford Hospital and was appalled at the care that I was seeing um, uh, as someone who cared a lot about queer community in terms of like patients being groomed with the wrong gender and things like that. This is probably 50, 20 years ago now at this point. So a friend of mine asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up and I said I wanted to work in trans health care. Um, fast forward to two weeks later, I had a job as the new, the first nurse at Lion Martin Health Services which is um, an FQ, a federally qualified healthcare center out of San Francisco uh, that primarily serves lesbian and transgender patients historically, but it's now shifted to really, I'm just gonna actually read their mission because it matters, um, where they serve trans non-binary, gender non-conforming and intersex communities and cisgender women with specific sensitivity to LGBTQA sexual orientation, disability, size, race, ethnicity, and language, regardless of immigration status or ability to pay. Um, and so the model of medicine that I grew up in was this very historically feminist model that um, was also kind of at the cutting edge of being in an urban environment, looking at real time impacts of anything. I didn't understand that at the time, <laughs> I was too young. Um, but uh, fast forward to, again, I had two kids, couldn't work 80 hours a week anymore. So I had to shift from my dream job uh, to working at what's called the San Francisco Health Plan, which is a public, Medi it's a Medicaid agency that we um, are the community option for the county of San Francisco. 
Um, and our team is responsible for a lot of programming um, that I think this group will actually, I'm like, oh, the ways in which you could help the, <laughs> the slow process of Excel and us. Um, and so we, but when I first started there, I, I became, they, they recruited me as a HEDIS, a lead HEDIS nurse. I had no idea what that meant. And HEDIS means the health effectiveness information and data set. And so it's basically how insurance companies and well, anyone who's delivering care reports out specific measures to any auditing agency like the states and feds um, and any accreditation that they're seeking. Um, and so I learned a lot about how measures, unequally measures are created for many people and how we perpetuate disparities in care by the numbers that we're collecting from an insurance agency. Um, and so I started becoming pretty vocal about that um, as soon as I became the manager over that position, as well as overseeing other positions like our health education department, um, which really serves to improve health literacy. And what I mean by that is um, allowing people to learn about not just Western medicine, but the intersectionality of Western medicine and all of the rest of it, because if from a community based model, because the more we empower any member to engage in their own health care and understand where their access points are, the better outcomes we will see for any population. Um, and so our team does that through both our health education modeling. Um, we also do member incentives. Uh, so if we look at a target population, I shouldn't say that, when we look at a po population of focus, um, again, words matter, target is a military model word, so I, I veer away from those. Um, but a lot of people in corporate America, especially insurance, use that all the time. Um, and so, but looking at that data on an annual basis where we then um, look at basically reporting out to the states are what we historically have had as a QI model of care. And now, like you said, because of COVID, people started to understand how in real time disparities enact themselves. So things that we've been working on as a team for years are now all of a sudden like our CEO understands them. And so we're starting to get a lot more traction around a lot of our efforts um, with what we're working on. I love that you are like a person after my own heart because we have so many similarities. I too worked um, in an LGBT focus FQHC back in the day and it just shows how much is needed and what technology can do because when I was practicing I had patients um, who were flying to me from South Carolina to Maryland because they couldn't find a provider to, to care for them. So there are so many different things out there that we're opening now where we can have LGBT focused telehealth and train more people to be aware because there are some physicians that are like, oh, didn't learn that in med school, don't want to learn. Like we should be continuously learning. And otherwise, I also loved how you mentioned that you you shifted careers. Like it's totally possible and it's totally okay. So this is this organization is called Girl Develop It, but it's for all people, women and non-binary people who want to change in their career or want to escalate their career it's never too late so you can be 40 and working in another field and you can translate and transfer into tech it's okay to join healthcare later if that's something that you want to do a lot of times people who contribute to healthcare. i know when i joined medical school the people who were bankers and all of those had very great different perspectives and, and that's okay and then I also love when you mentioned that you took that job um, under the HEDIS department and you had no idea what HEDIS meant. <laughs> like, like, people get really afraid. And we're going to have a LinkedIn discussion tomorrow for those who may chime in. But people get very terrified and afraid of those job points that it says and, and the things, the requirements, quote unquote, that they want. And it shows that most of the time women do not apply for jobs that they don't think that they meet every mark for. But men do, and they get it, and they do a bad job at it. Not all the time for the guys who may be watching, but, but women do it better. So it's okay to take that job and learn on the job and grow on the job. And from there, we're able to lead efforts towards like healthcare, decreasing healthcare disparities, which is something that we definitely should focus on. And 
like we've all said that the pandemic has highlighted a lot of the inequities that are going around in healthcare, but they've been here for a long time. So there are a lot of things that we can do and a lot of things that people are watching in the projects that you guys may be creating that can impact and decrease health disparities over time. So we're, we're just getting started, guys, and, and that you guys came with, with a bang, like just talking about your passions and what you do in healthcare. So we kind of hit on it a little bit in terms of what problems are you trying to solve in your work? You guys already kind of answered that. So I kind of want us to build on that, speaking on what Elizabeth just mentioned about decreasing healthcare disparities. Are there any trying to think of how to word this, but like, how can someone in a position such as yourself work to decrease healthcare disparities and influence those in your organizations to also get on board? And that, that can be healthcare disparities in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of social um, and economic disadvantages in terms of sexual orientation or in terms of disabilities, because dis disabled people or people who are differently abled are also discriminated against. So I'm going to, I know that's a big question, but I think you guys can handle it. So I'm going to start with <laughs> Nechari. I mean, the two words that I think of immediately um, are, uh, courage and curiosity. Um, first is the courage to surface many of those things where um, you, you essentially, because I work with so many different clients. Um, and so just putting that at the forefront of our conversation, like this is the angle we are working from and a community centered equitable design lens. Um, we're working design justice lens. We are working to center the lived experiences of those who are also often marginalized within these conversations within what is design. Um, and then from there, it's about having a conversation about what that looks like and also how we can bring, you know, not just saying lived experiences, but also just having the courage and curiosity to think about how you can bring people into the fold, how you can respect where they're coming from, how you can protect um where they what their lived experience is and how they want to co-design um this experience and these outputs with you and also understanding your responsibility a part of uh, my past experience is bioethics so understanding the overall sense that you have a responsibility to not be extractive in what you are um, doing and designing um, and really truly understanding, you know, a lot of people talk about empathy and I could go off on that, but really understanding what it means to not just empathize, but take it a step further and, and invite people into designing with you, um, you know, intentionally, responsibly, you know, um, so that's a huge part of how I'm thinking about the, the question that you just asked. I love that. Um, Dr. Jones? I have a thought to build on that. Yeah. And sometimes we think about new things coming from wishes, like I wish my phone and my watch interacted, but I really think that we can learn a lot from complaints. But in order to learn from that, you really have to use some humility and listening skills. Because do people complain a lot? Yes, right? But at the base of a lot of complaints is opportunity. So maybe you can't fix that problem for that person. However, it is likely that their concern is copied by other people. And maybe you can prevent this same pitfall for other people. But in order to do that, if someone is, for me, in your office, very upset about something, you have to think like, okay, let's remove self. Like, is it me? And then think about what caused this whole calamity. Is it that it's wild that pharmacy prices are different from pharmacy to pharmacy and this person is very tired and angry? 
maybe? Is it that the workplace has become too strict and not really healthcare focused? And so this person took their only sick day to bring their sick kid in. And then I told them they don't need antibiotics. And they're like, I need to go back to work. You know, there's a lot of things, but you have to listen really well and think about what could be the underlying concern here. And sometimes that individual is not in the space to do this deep dive with you, but you can listen really well, even write down these concerns, share them with your colleagues, managers, other teams, and think about how to get to the bottom of it. Because I think a lot of the complaints that I've heard in my life, I see later, those are huge opportunities for advocacy, for um, innovation, just places to grow. Absolutely. Elizabeth? Um, I'll also just kind of expand on all of that because it's exactly correct. Like we all are reflections of both our work environment as well as the systems that we interact with. And that goes from both that clinical room um, and then interpreting the stories that are happening there appropriately at all levels of care. And COVID is like such a, like I've, that, I've had my personal experience around that, that I think is full of valuable information. Um, and my thing that I was going to say is that feedback is a gift, uh, specifically for any white people who are on here, as you are learning about dismantling the internalized racism that you have, um, it's really important to understand how you receive feedback in a professional environment um, is key to doing that. And it's why I love QI as well, because QI is another way that in which that you can insert a lot of things that um, when you are saying, I want to see this improvement, but people aren't listening to you for who you may be, um, you get to subvert that system by, um, by kind of putting something into QI because then it gets funded and used. Um, and so that ended up happening. I wanted to also bring up from a systemic issue around COVID, what I'm seeing, um, what my experience was within San Francisco with COVID implementation, which was access to a lot of data. To my experience, now I'm working with the state of Maine in their new Office of Population Health Equity for just a few hours and their experience around data and what you see around the lived experience of people in those communities um, and how those disparities kind of happened in real time. So in San Francisco, uh, because we had access to data all the time, there's a lot of universities, a lot of information happening and research happening. We we're able to look at the fact that within our mission district, that is where our tests, it tests need to be just everywhere all the time and, and vaccination stuff, right? Like all of that stuff needed to be in certain neighborhoods and accessible from the get-go. And as soon as we had that information, we were working with community partners. That's another key part. It wasn't just us. It was any folks who had not engaged in the system ever. And that's a different sort of public health threat that we're looking at. And so how we look at disparities at that point, you're really looking at very different sorts of programming to get way more nuanced to understand why people may not be engaging in care. Uh, and so data, this all comes back to data though, because when you're just looking at your computer, you're not that phys you're not the person in that clinical room. You're just looking at all these data points, trying to figure out how are we allocating massive amounts of funds to ensure that people are getting access to the care that they need. Um, and so I think that answers the question. It does, and it brings up so many more, but we still have time, guys. And I'm going to ask Sarah to answer the question, too. Sure. So I um, don't have maybe access to immediate solutions or, or um, leverage the way that some of the other panelists do. Uh, I'm kind of, um, I think they call me an individual contributor. Um, which is a nice way of saying like grunt. And I say that affectionately, like a nice little, you know, getting the things done, like a cute little ant, good with it. Um, but one of the things I've been trying to work really hard on is realizing that in general, corporations will only do what's right if they have to. And keeping that in mind, when I have been in a situation where it's really helpful to make more progress with a corporation, I try to always have a little ROI written up about why it is a good idea to consider this new process. And ROI is return on investment. Um, and basically, businesses respond really well to money. So if I can show them it's in their best interest financially, at least a little bit, it helps leverage the idea that this is a worthwhile investment, not just because it's the right thing to do, 
which I wish was enough, but to also add the financial incentive of also this will this will benefit you financially. And ultimately, until we can reshift away from a stockholder beholden financial um, dynamic in corporate America, we're I'm going to work with what I have and, you know, dream big, but play the play the hand in 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 my hand, I guess. Play the hand I'm dealt. I don't know. Not good with idioms. So. I love it. And I think you brought up a good point. I will highlight that three out of four of you talk about feedback. Feedback is important in different ways. One with the direct user that you're using or patient that you're working with or population getting that feedback is actually seeing where you need to go and where your deficits are. Also how to, how you handle that feedback, whether it or not it be from the patient, whether it be from your supervisor or your organization and them giving you feedback in your 360 evaluations or something to tell you how to get better or are you giving them that same feedback, whether or not they accept it or not. Um, and then also how you organize that and structure that, like you were saying, when you're working for a corporation or a larger company, there has to be some kind of payoff most of the time. A lot of people aren't philanthropists or people that are just like do good organizations. Of course, we all would love to be in mission or, uh, driven organizations that are aligned with your beliefs, like the mission statement that Elizabeth read in the beginning. But sometimes when you're getting into work, you got to pay the bills. So we're being honest and transparent with you guys. So feedback is important. So it, figuring out how to structure feedback kind of is, is a great way in order to say, okay, like, here's the problem. This is what we're seeing and the data that supports that. And I recommend that you guys do this. If you do this, this may be the outcomes. If you don't do this, this may be the outcomes. And a lot of times people will complain about working in certain organizations and not necessarily having a say but number one, those are ways that you can try to work to get more people on board to move forward with that. And this is an innovation panel. So sometimes you may work in a job and get experience and learn and see what things are out there. And you guys are early enough in your career for those watchers out there who may want to start your own organization or start your own um app or whatever to help address the problem and the need that you're seeing. So like we were saying, the world is your oyster, but also kind of figuring out where you are. And also like Dr. Jones was saying, like, we like to think in terms of wishes. So I wish this would be better. or I wish this would change. Or I wish there was no racism. I wish there were no healthcare disparities, but they're here. So when we move beyond that wish, we can, can open up a lot more doors and a lot more possibilities. Now, since we're talking about wishes, um, let's, let's pretend we have this magic wand. So I'm gonna ask each of you, um, if you had a magic wand, what is an area or a couple of areas that you would like to be seen in terms of improving healthcare by utilizing technology? I know we could probably talk about this for another six hours, but I'm going to ask for you guys to just say, okay, I have a magic wand, boom, universal healthcare, boom, apps that work. <laughs> but uh, I will start with um, Elizabeth. Not you? Oh, I was just going to say, Sarah and I were recently scheming about, she was going to figure out the finances of how this is going to work, and I was going to figure out the delivery of how this is going to work. Because yes, universal healthcare in my dream world would be, or I mean, we have every system of public health delivery or every coverage of medicine in this, every model of it in this country. It is a waste on so many levels and it's obviously not equitable in so many ways um, when there's real ways that we can create those systems. Um, as long as we have, for me, the key is also the policy needs to be in place. So my personal, um, piece was when I started being kind of the data entry person, a HEDIS person, that's all I did was look at charts, also enter in data uh, to make and make sure that us as an insurance company, that we were providing that clinical care that we said we were providing to our members. When I saw that, in fact, they weren't because the data that they were, the way they were doing it was flawed and discriminatory. That's when I started following my own gut, my own voice. Um, I hired a coach. I figured out how to 
show up um, instead of being the angry lesbian or the angry queer person on the job. My partner is trans. Like I'm just a very, I came from a queer history. Like I'm out and I'm proud about it, but there was a lot of transphobia and homophobia in my workplace and racism and sex, right? Like it is, even though it's public health, they were run as like an insurance company. So it was like entering into a corporate model of delivery. I, I learned the game. I learned the, like all of that stuff and I learned how to work it. And so for me it was, okay, well, if here are all of the things that are in my way, how do I get that to the point where now I will be working with the state of California next year on all of their policy around trans care? Because the barriers that I faced with just personal bias and how that plays out in real time in your work environment and prohibits you from actually moving forward from larger things is real. And I just want to speak to that, that that is real. So really pacing yourself and understanding that it's not yours <laughs> and figuring out how to move around it um, without being emotionally responsible for others as they learn about these systems um, is just was a lot, large part of my personal journey. Sarah? Um, gosh, I think, I mean, truly, if I could, if I could have a dream of anything, it would be um, universal delivery of all services, um, whether that be care, whether that be digital access, whether that be treatment, whether that be medications, whether that be um, lab results or, you know, imaging, but something that is universally delivered, that is universally equitable, something that could be as simple as, you know, a phone app that is an all-encompassing portal to health that is integrated with every health professional that you deal with in every facility and every location, just to have all of that synchronized, to have a centralized location where everybody can interact with each other, all records are available, and, you know, I, yes, I have tried to sit down and figure out the, the logistics of this, and, and then I can't because it's, it's a lot. But, um, you know, I know that there are a lot of really amazing people listening right now. Hopefully someone can make this work or something better. But, you know, that would be great. But that would be for me. And, that, and then not only that, you know, equitable and accessible access of care, but the delivery being reliant on, like, infrastructure that's reliable. So like sort of, you know, not just the delivery being there, but that the delivery is reliable and consistent too. So if we're going to dream big, you know, just fix the you know, infrastructure too. Why not? Sure. Yes. Nejari? Well, the mischief that I have in my head says that if I had a magic wand, I would find a way to duplicate that magic wand and distribute other magic wands to people um, so that they can have their own sense of magic. You know, the interesting thing is I, I too asked the magic wand question. I like it. It gives you the little fuzzy feels at the end. And a huge part of it, like when I'm thinking about a magic wand question or just magic wands in general, is that sense of agency that you have over defining what is important and valuable to you. So, you know, that's why I would give a magic wand to whomever, you know, the most disenfranchised in these systems, in these broken systems. The people that are often seen as voiceless, right? We are giving voices to the voiceless, like, no, they have voices, right? You're not listening to them or you are filtering that through that capitalist lens, right? And so what does it mean for someone to define what health means for them, what it means to be healthy, how to have better agency over their own health outcomes? you know, whatever that looks like, whether it's organizationally, you know, within a, a, an organization, a company, or in a mutual aid group, like what does that technology look like? And defining technology very generally here now, what does the technology look like in order for them to shape their own definition and agency around health? Um, outside of that, you know, systems, yes, yeah, systems come and go. Um, particular interests like I have so many varied interests over the years of different points that I think are important but one of the things that I always strive for is figuring out how we can give more power more of that agency to the people who are 
oftentimes seen as affected by instead of affecting change within these systems. I love that. Dr. Jones? What a thing to follow, right? I think in listening to that, balance is important, right? Because how I'm a family doctor, so I'm very biased about continuity of care through the lifespan. And I'm particularly aware of the issue of transitioning care. And that could be from uh, if you are seeing exclusive pediatric care to adult care. If you are a student in one city and you go to a different city. If you're an adult who moves and relocates. If you're a person whose insurance changes. And I find that the people who are most affected by this are those who haven't practiced this skill. So are young adults people who are have other tasks that don't have the actual bandwidth to deal with all of these transitions. And this ends up falling out in this entire injustice lineup, right? And our current system, I, I agree agency is so important, but our current system places so much responsibility on the individual to know all of this information. And if you're not healthcare oriented, healthcare experienced, to know all your vaccinations, your whole medical history, every dose of medication you've ever tried, what doctor you use, what doctor you will need, that is work. That is a actual lift of work, right? And it's adding to that a person who's responsible for other humans to lift that for other people as well, right? And so if I had a magic wand, I would make this less work because I really think that the easiest thing in your life should be what we do, right? So we should have healthcare be some of those mindless things that are already done, you know, like not something that you have to go out and extra try hard to do because health is essential, right? We're saying that this is a right of life and you really make it strategically hard. And that's by multiple insurance companies, ele electronic medical records that don't communicate. That's many things that happen. Pharmacies that don't communicate even within the same branch, all of these things make it hard for a person to live their best healthy life. And I really wish we could ameliorate that in some way. I love that. And I think that you guys brought up so many good points that we're going to leave for you guys who are watching to solve for us. So hopefully if we come back for a reunion in 10 years, we'll have a whole new system and, and everything working smoothly. For our final question in our last 10 minutes, I'm going to let us all kind of meditate on how we would answer this because we have so many people who are viewing this. I know last year throughout our hackathon, we had about six or 700 people who had joined throughout various aspects. So I'm sure some other people will be watching this. So their biggest question as they're looking to start their career in tech and after this panel, hopefully healthcare tech, because it's hot and it's necessary because we all will experience needing to either be a part of the healthcare system or having a loved one who is. So what piece of advice do you have for those who may be considering starting a career in healthcare tech? And in particular, if you want to add or if you have any idea, because I know that everyone has had a different journey and those who are watching may also have different journeys. If they were to go in healthcare tech into your particular field, um, what is a piece of advice that you would have for them in order to attain that goal? I'll start with Dr. Erin. In order to like be a ethical functioning physician in the telehealth space, I think it's very, very important that we anchor this in real life experiences. Because no matter how great one system is in the current setup, we need to have people continue to have a continual relationship. And you have to be that anchor because like Sarah outlined that these corporations are gonna push a capitalist mission but one of our jobs as physicians that deal with human beings is to anchor this in humanity and how this works in the system. Because we might have 
great uh, boards of directors and people thinking big ideas. But one of our jobs is to anchor this in, okay, let's plug this back into how this actually works with the rest of healthcare, because this is a huge system and not one thing. And so I think for physicians or people who are interested in healthcare in the tech space is to dig into both. You have to be all in traditional healthcare. So you know the pain points and you know where people will go. And then you can add into the tech space a really nice perspective and contribute to that space as much as possible. I love that point because I'm a member of a lot of different communities and there are a lot of physicians and other providers who are looking to transition from traditional in-person medicine into technology. And their biggest question is, how can I contribute? I've just been in the clinic for 20 years, or I'm just an ER doc. I don't know. But there are so many different things that come from just having those lived experiences, because we have people who are creating these apps, who are starting these companies and these organizations who have a great mission-oriented, idealistic manner of how medicine works. And then they build the app and they're like, oh, what's next? So it's great to have these people who have been in healthcare, who know how electronic medical records work and not only rebuilding another Epic or another Cerner or something like that, but knowing why we ask certain questions and why we can't just cut corners to make it quicker to distribute it to more populations. There is a method to the madness. So trying to figure out not only what we can do to make things better and more equitable and people healthier, but how to do it in a safe manner and how to keep that human component there. Um, Sarah. So um, I, again, having sort of stumbled into an industry that I didn't know existed, um, I love telling people about how they can get involved with it. And the truth is that there is really no wrong way. Um, if you have a background in medical coding and billing, it's a great fit. But, you know, say you're also who's burnt out and you don't want to do, you know, inpatient clinician care anymore. We use and utilize, you know, medical reviews from all over the world all the time with medical professionals who work remotely. And all of the digitized medical records that we gather during the course of a clinical trial need medical oversight, review, and input routinely. And our industry is very fast moving. So typically a study, a trial length is anywhere from six months to 36 months. And that's it. And then you're on to your next trial. And so finding clinicians, especially clinicians who are willing to make that leap from clinical care to being able to oversee these new developments or this new growth potential, it's huge. And, and it's something that we sometimes struggle with because we don't always get a robust, you know, look of what we really need. We get a very, because it is very tech centric and, and because it is heavy programming, we get a very specific type of person sometimes. We need everybody. We need all types. We need everybody everywhere. And we need more people that are going to be present because a lot of people have been doing this for about 20, 25 years. This industry is, you know, everyone that I know has been in it forever and they all started in the same sort of unusual way, but that means it's also kind of getting stagnant in their development and their thought, you know, growth. not everybody wants growth mindset. That's okay. But that doesn't mean I have to stop. So, you know, that's why we got all just keep pushing. So I know that it was kind of a roundabout way, but you know, Oh, no, it wasn't you actually like I mean, LinkedIn, and I'll send you to a recruiter. They call me every day. <laughs> You've actually inspired me to transition to a CRO, so I'm going to talk to you afterwards. You should. But <laughs> I mean, really, I know everybody hates insurance companies. They they like, and that's my, I, I hate them the most. But um, I at least feel like CROs are like trying to make sure everybody's safe and okay and like holding it, pharmaceutical companies accountable. So, yeah, you know, yeah. trying to do good work, I swear. <laughs> There, there, like I said, there's a method to the madness and we need yes. people in all positions to make it better. And like you said, there are a lot of people who have been in these positions for decades. So we need new blood 
because if you keep practicing things the way you've always practiced, you're going to get those outcomes you've always gotten. So we need to think outside the box and create people who, not create people, but hey, <laughs> um, encourage people to think outside the box and to join these innovative fields. Liz. Um, I would say that no matter whatever job you are in, whether it be program manager or individual, any individual contributor role you are ever working in, you can impact diversity, equity, inclusion, um, you, just no matter what. And from a programmatic perspective, like we have a DEI tool that we developed as a team. I'm more than willing to share with anybody, like making sure that you are responsible for what any program you're looking on from the get go and in the evaluation process has that embedded within the system. We did that and that's how we advocated for doulas, doulas to not be covered um, in the state of California through Medicaid. Uh, same with community health workers. That's also not gonna be a covered service. That comes from that community model of listening to members and then at our level, working with the state, advocating from a state around what we are seeing that our members need uh, in order to close gaps in care that we're seeing in the data. Um, so I would just say you, everyone can have impact no matter where. And if you think that you can't, it's because you don't know enough yet. So keep learning. Absolutely. I love that advice. And closing out with Nechari. Some of the things that I was thinking about, I was like a practical one and then this over overview. But I guess practically knock on all the doors. Even though I had a healthcare background, You'd be surprised how that translated into user, you know, speaking to user experience professionals and I'm like, okay. So being able to like hone my craft and really describing what I was doing helped me when I was communicating all of those things um, for a position specifically within user experience. Um, so I would, I would just, somebody had a contact me form on their portfolio. It's like, hi, my name is, you know, <laughs> and I would get responses. I was like, Good job, you know, user experience professionals connecting. Um, and sometimes like I would, especially at the height of like working on COVID-19 projects, I would go out into my community and start testing some of the state's user experience applications and I would go on a rant on social media. And sometimes I would even connect with people that way. They're like, I saw what you wrote, you know? It's like, let's chat. Mm -hmm. um, have those shared experiences and really connect with people and you know some there were even some uh paid opportunities that arose from that or even projects that i was able to work on you know relating to accessibility or you know um artificial intelligence and things like that uh within the space um so that's one piece of advice the other one is i do a lot of branding uh work as well and so you know your vision is like your destination your mission uh, are the steps that you take to get to that destination. And so I encourage people to look beyond missions and focusing, like what I'm hearing on the panel too, is focusing on how do those organizations get to that destination? What is their strategy? What does success look like to them specifically in terms of their operations? And does that mission align with how you'd like to work? What gifts you'd like to contribute? based off of your skills and what outcomes make you feel good at night and the fact that you can close your eyes and rest um and so those are the things that i feel uh, have been a part of like my compass and moving in the various different pivots in my career um and so i extend that you know to to others as well i love that and i second that advice it's it's definitely especially your first piece about building communities because there are people who may be living the experiences that you want to learn more about so why not learn from them and reach out to people because you would sometimes i think a lot of people kind of say oh nobody wants to talk to me or they're so busy like so many people one love to talk about themselves and love to share what they're passionate about so there are definitely ways to do that via social media or LinkedIn. We're going to be having a LinkedIn session tomorrow where we'll talk about some tips on how to reach out to people. I know personally, I love setting up virtual coffees, even if I don't want anything. If I just see that there's something cool that I want to learn more about, and I'm like, hey, like, let's have a virtual coffee. Let me learn about this new thing in healthcare or this new wearable device. Like, why not? 
because there, there's so much information to share and we have so much at our fingertips right now utilizing this technology that we should use it. And it can actually sometimes even help us move further in our career goals. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. So I just want to say that this was a wonderful panel. You guys have shared so much information and hopefully our listeners out there will be looking you guys up on LinkedIn. That's another plug for that LinkedIn thing tomorrow. And <laughs> It looks like Liz mouth that she doesn't have LinkedIn. Well, we need to get you it. But <laughs> oh, I have it. It's just old and not updated. For yeah. Years, but yeah. We're watching you. But you, know, you can reach me. I'll message you back every message. <laughs> if you guys would like, is it okay if you shared um, your preferred method of contact as we close out? I'll start with Natari. Oh, I didn't know if Aaron was going to go. But, oh, I was um, just going to say LinkedIn is fine. <laughs> yeah, same. Um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Nachari Riley. Um, my LinkedIn is intentionally sparse. <laughs> That's another story. Um, however you feel about the Bird app at this moment, um, you can also... <laughs> connect with me there um, with my first name with S M after Nachari. So Nachariism. Um, uh, yeah, I think those are the two primary ones. Sarah. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's um, just LinkedIn backslash uh, Sarah K. Luciano 207 because I'm so clever. <laughs> <laughs> but I will actually respond eventually, I swear. Um, I put mine in the chat. I think that goes to everyone. It's my email and then also LinkedIn and it'll come to my email that you've sent me something. <laughs> and if anybody has any questions for me randomly, I'm also on LinkedIn under my name and um, I'm working on the Instagram trying to be young like you guys. So Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R, the letter D, Graham, G-R-A-M, Dr. D, Graham. So you can DM me and we can talk about health things there. Amazing. I just popped in here to, to wrap it up, but thank you all so much. That was, um, I was actually asking Katie if we could just cancel the rest of the day and keep you guys for two to three hours, but I know you all have so many amazing jobs to get back to. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your thoughts, your hearts, um, your passions. It's just really inspiring. And I know it's going to help some folks. We had a lot of already some topics, um, some projects in the space. So I think this is really great to kind of really push some folks in the right direction. So thank you so much. Um, we'll let you all go. We're going to have this screen will go dark again, and then the sessions will open up. You can definitely find those. Click the agenda for anyone following along up top. That will take you to the different workshops that will happen this afternoon. I think we fixed our Slack issue. Thank you so much to Jessica. She came in and kind of told me what was going on. We had the way the people were members, multi-channel, single channel. We've got that straight. We've figured that out. If anyone has problems, message me directly. I'll get you fixed. And we're going to move on with our day. Thank you again so much. Um, we really appreciate it. We'll share this recording in the email tomorrow morning and have a wonderful day. You too. Bye.